Fine, can you hear me okay? Great. Welcome everyone to Old MacDonald Had a Farm Injury. We're really pleased to have you join us this evening. I want to start by saying that the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. A few housekeeping items just before we get started. The lecture will be about 35 minutes, and there will be plenty of time for questions for Dr. Volklander. Uh, this microphone will be passed around so that uh, you can pose a question and everybody can hear your question. And for those of you that are online, please go ahead and ask your questions by typing them into the chat box. I need to um, read carefully the following statement. Photographs, video recordings of this event may be made, and in fact are. The personal information which may be recorded is collected under the authority of Section 33C of the Alberta Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and will be protected under Part 2 of that Act. If gathered, it will be used for the purpose of educational and promotional materials produced by the school. And when you came in, you may have uh, collected from us a, sh a small event evaluation form. We'd appreciate it if you take a moment to give us your feedback and on your way out the door, uh, the staff from the School of Public Health will collect those from you. They are helpful to us in terms of planning events in, in the future. And if you're on social media, we invite you to participate in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag TIPH lecture. There will be a reception just in the hallway after the lecture and uh, Dr. Volklander will be there and available to chat with you and answer any questions and we invite you to enjoy refreshments with us. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Q Young. He is the Dean of the School of Public Health and he will introduce our speaker. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome those of you who are in the room and also those of you who are joining us online. Tonight's event is the fourth installment in a series of lectures that we call This is Public Health. And members of the public often ask us, what is public health? Rather than explaining what public health is, we thought it is best that we showcase the work of some of our professors and also the impact of the research on our daily lives. Previously, we have had four, uh, three uh, lectures on water and sanitation, on addictions, and also on mother's health. Next week is the Canadian Agricultural Safety Week. So it is timely that we are here to learn about farm safety and how we can prevent farm injuries. Injury prevention is public health. And now let me introduce Dr. Don Boglander. Dr. Boglander received his PhD from the University of Alberta. He's currently a professor at the, in the School of Public Health and also director of the Injury Prevention Center, where he conducts research into the causes and frequency and prevention of injuries. Dr. <laughs> Thank you, Q. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good to see people coming out on such a cool March day. Don't you think March has kind of been a big disappointment so far? I think so. So today's outline, I'm going to talk a bit about farm fatalities in Canada uh, through our surveillance system, some of the strategies that have been used to improve farm safety, uh, why farm safety, I think, will continue to be of concern and then the future of farm safety. So this is me, circa 1963, up by Boyle on the farm. And you can see, even at that young age, I really wasn't looking towards being a farmer the way I was dressed, maybe a bikini model or something. But you can see in the background here the old uh, pull-type immobile thrashing machine and a plow here. If you look really carefully, there's a calf there grazing away. And Somebody's idea of a square and, uh, um, or not so square, granary there. Our farm is pretty, pretty uh, my dad used to car call it hard scrabble. Um, we never had running water. It was, uh, it was an interesting place to grow up. I remember um, doing all the things farm kids do by myself primarily. Uh, walking on ice on dugouts that I shouldn't have been on in the spring. Um, hanging around uh, um, the, the cattle. My dad gave me one warning. The only safety message he ever gave me was, 
uh, paid good attention to the bull, they're kind of unpredictable. So I did. Uh, I was pretty lucky. We left the farm when I was 12. And my parents never uh, had me operate any equipment, which um, for a 12-year-old back in, uh, in this era was actually quite amazing because most of my peers were driving tractors and other pieces of equipment at that age. So farming, how dangerous is it? Well, in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, it's about the third most dangerous occupation. Canada, it's a little bit less, the fourth dangerous most occupation occupation after mining, fisheries, and construction. Um, it's been this way for decades. It really hasn't changed very much. Uh, in general, farming hasn't um, realized the same benefit of occupational health and safety uh, rules that uh, other industries around North America and other Western co uh, countries have, uh, have enjoyed. So this is the number of fatalities between 1990 and 2012 in Canada. Um, there's roughly 2,200 and change here, about 105 a year. And you can see it gradually is dropping off over time. And this kind of follows the farm population. Uh, in 1990, there's about a million plus farmers in Canada. Right now, it's around 550, 600,000. So the population these 22 years has dropped off significantly on farms, and the number of fatalities have uh, dropped as well. If you look at a rate, uh, it's about 1.5% per annum uh, reduction in the rate over time. It's, uh, it's, it's been quite gradual, probably not as... Uh, uh, if you look at other types of uh, injuries over this time period, like, or fatalities over this time period, like motor vehicle collisions, um, that has dropped off much more dramatically uh, than uh, fatality rates on farms. If you look at it by age and sex, you can see it's primarily uh, a male uh, issue. The males do most of the heavy lifting on the farm, uh, and even at a very young age, often uh, children are paired with their fathers to do farm tasks. So you can see even in the one to five crowd, the boys have a quite a bit higher uh, uh, injury experience or fatality experience than, than the, the female children. If you look at it by age, there's quite an interesting um, phenomena that we see. So we, it's, this is this more or less the same. The green bars are the number of fatalities. But if you look at the black boxes here, that's the rate. And you can see after age 60, the rate of uh, injury for farmers rises quite dramatically. Uh, this is probably due to a lot of things that affect seniors. Pe you know, seniors lose strength, they lose a bit of coordination. Maybe they're taking multiple medication. Maybe their eyesight's not so good. So it puts them at greater risk of injury. But uh, but what we found through some of our research is that as farmers get older, and you can ask a retired farmer, um, uh, how, mu how much time do you work in the farm? You say, well, I'm retired, so I only work 35 hours a week, right? So that's a, re that's a retired farmer. And wh what we found is that in task selection or task allocation and during the busy uh, periods on the farm, that the older farmers will, will work with the machinery because they know that machinery. And, um, and uh, it's easy for them to sit all day. So, so you hear stories like this. Yeah, old Billy doesn't get around too much anymore. He's 85. He doesn't walk very good. But we throw him up into the combine. And if we give him a sandwich, he'll work all day. And he can pee out the door if he needs to. So, yeah, so it's not, not atypical for, uh, for, that, for that type of scenario on the farm. And what they found, um, my last meeting I was at in Saskatchewan, is that it's so hard to get experienced farm help that, that um, the farming community is actually relying more and more on these uh, retired farmers. If we look at uh, age by time, there's been modest declines in all age groups that basically follow the national trend. No age group really stands out. So who died on the farm? And this is an interesting chart, and we'll talk a bit about, a bit, uh, about this more as I get uh, uh, further on in the lecture. So about 65% of the people who die on farms in Canada are part of the farm family, either the owner operator themselves, a child of the operator, or some other relative like a spouse or a cousin or, or a brother or something like that. So it's primarily, when you look at fatalities, the people at risk are primarily the farm family. 
If we look at the distribution by month, um, no surprises here in, a, in our northern climate with one season where you do agriculture, we see that thing, fatalities ramp up in May when seeding starts and continues um, uh, peaking towards the fall months where uh, harvesting is, is occurring, where people are working long hours um, to get the crop off in case it rains or snows or freezes or all those good things that happen late fall. Looking at the main causes, uh, practically all uh, uh, agricultural fatality data worldwide will identify the rollover, the tractor rollover, as a primary cause of, uh, of death, followed by runovers, so people that are, that are outside uh, are off the tractor or off the combine or whatever and are run over by that piece of machinery. The next is entangled or caught in a machine, uh, then pinned or struck by a machine, followed by um, motor vehicle collisions or motor vehicle machinery interactions. So here's an example to visualize um, what can happen on a farm. So you've got some rugged terrain here. T tractors are kind of top heavy at the best of times. So you can see that if you hit that, if that tire hits that bump there, that tractor is going to go over. This is, a, this is a good tractor. It's got a rollover protective structure on it. Uh, entanglement injuries are very common on farms. This is a uh, feed mill here, a stationary piece of equipment that you back a tractor up to. You'd hook up this uh, drive line here to a, a, a spline that comes out of the back of the, the tractor. It'd slip over and you could uh, engage the clutch and uh, make this work. You can see here that there's no, uh, no shield on the part on the drive line into the machine and the pulley here is also not shielded. Uh, power takeoffs are particularly ugly beasts. They will grab your sleeve, they will grab your loose clothing, and they will grab your hair, and they're very unforgiving. A lot of the machinery over the last number of decades has grown immensely in size. Here's a big seeding rig. It's got lots of hydraulics uh, that could fail, and it's got lots of uh, pinch points if you're doing... Um, uh, moving it around the farmyard where there might, might, might not much, much room. Whoops, what did I do? Oh, I can go back. No, I can't go back. No. Okay, thank you. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah, pinch point. So these big pieces of equipment, while you... You, you, it, the turning radius here for the tractor might be very slow. When you get out in these wings here, the, the machine moves actually very quickly. It's like the, you ever play in those merry-go-rounds when you're a kid, right? If you sit in the middle, you're pretty, pretty safe. You don't have to hang on too much. If you're on the outside, it's going very quickly. So it's kind of like that. So uh, when these move and you're in the vicinity, there's a chance that you could be caught by them. Um, machine motor vehicle collision, and this uh, particular instance here, the hydraulic failed on this uh, disc while this truck was passing, coming from the opposite direction, and it almost sheared the cab off. So there's this type of interaction. Um, also with slow moving equipment, there's a lot of rear end collisions and things like that. So looking at the top five causes that I've just talked about a bit, We've seen over the years a significant drop in rollover injuries and a significant drop in entanglements. So that's a good thing. The other types, major causes being pinned and struck by machinery, motor vehicle collisions and uh, runovers have not uh, declined as much. Actually, being pinned and struck with our uh, larger machinery is actually increasing. So I look at the top five causes by the age groups involved. You can see here with the old farmers, remember the, the, the steep increase there, we find that the old farmers have a lot more um, rollovers and a lot more runovers um, than um, older farmers that are killed by other things. So there, there's a real, um, these types of uh, fatalities predominate. predominate. Um, with the rollovers, what you, ha you have with the older farmers is when they, when they do get allocated to task on the farm or make their choices, they will take the older equipment. And often, if it's an older tractor, it doesn't have a rollover protective structure on it, and it might not have seat belts, 
And if it has seat belts, old farmers say, I never used a seat belt, and I'm not going to start now. Um, so uh, it puts them at higher risk. Uh, also, they're at higher risk for runovers. And a lot of these are runovers where the, the um, older farmer has fallen off the piece of equipment, and the piece of equipment runs over them. And also quite an interesting phenomena. Has anyone ever started a vehicle by shorting out the solenoid with a screwdriver? I used to do this. I had a Volkswagen once. My first pizza delivery job, the car they gave me, when I had to deliver a pizza, I had to crawl underneath and short out the starter to get it to turn over to turn it on. Anyway, what, with these older farmers, uh, the starter motor on a tractor is typically in front of the large drive wheels. And if you leave the tractor in gear, when you short out the solenoid to get the starter to engage, and the tractor starts up, it drives over you. And we had about a dozen um, old farmers that died this way. There's quite a pattern there. The other thing with this graph is that we see the little kids here, the under nine crowd, as being at particular risk of being run over. So these are kids that are working in the farmyard, or, work, or not working, I should say, they're in the vicinity of work being done in the, in, the, uh, in the farmyard or in the field and are run over by a piece of machinery. I remember um, when we first set up the surveillance <coughs> system, we were uh, going through all of the fatalities that we collected, about 800 at the time. And we um, going through them, it was very depressing. And I, I remember one, and it still s sticks in my mind to this day, there's a fellow doing seeding in his field. He had the four-year-old leaning against the fender on the tractor and the baby in one of those carry baskets, you know, that you can snap in your car, uh, resting on the gas tank on the tractor. And according to the, the fatality record, the four-year-old slipped, so he lunged to grab the four-year-old. The baby fell off, and he looked behind him as the cedar went over the baby. So this is a type of... Uh, scenario the kids find themselves or can find themselves on the farm. So basics on how to reduce injury. So in the injury world, we try to reduce injuries in three sort of broad categories. Through engineering, so if you think about um, airbags and cars or divided highways, those are all engineering solutions. Education, uh, you know, the mad people are out there educating you all the time about not drinking and driving. Um, YouTube's out there educating you about safety. There's all sorts of different things. You can pick up brochures. It's all education. Go to courses. And then there's enforcement, which largely in the occupational health sense is legislation. Some rules and guidelines that companies and businesses have to follow to uh, keep their employees safe. So we've had, as I mentioned before, I've had some engineering improvements around entanglements. And uh, if you look at this old first generation round baler here, you can see it's wide open. The guards have been taken off because they're probably bolted on and once they're off, they're off for good. Lots of potential for, uh, for harm to be done. And then we look at this more modern baler here, the pickups underneath, you can't, can't even really fall into it if you tried. Um, all the guards are hinged and toggled so you, they don't end up in the side of the road after somebody makes a repair, things like that. So this, this is a much safer piece of equipment, that, that's, and that's resulted in, um, uh, I, we think, uh, an improvement in, in entanglement uh, fatalities or a drop in fatal, entanglement fatalities. The other big engineering improvement that's happened over time is with uh, rollover protective structures on tractors. So you can see this older... I noticed my picture when, you know, when I was up to the beginning here. It seems like I'm advertising for John Deere here. I'm not really, I'm not really on their payroll. But if they want to put me on their payroll, I'm willing. Um, so this older John Deere here is, uh, doesn't have a rollover protective structure. So if this goes over, it, you know, somebody can get hurt. Uh, this newer John Deere here would have a seat belt assembly, and it comes standard with the rollover protective structure. So as these old tractors go out of service, and boy, tractors stay in service a lot of years. You can find some pretty old tractors out there still doing a day's work. Um, as they come out of service and these newer ones come into service, that's where we've seen the improvement in, or the decline in, in tractor rollover deaths. Education and awareness program. There are no empirical data supporting the effectiveness of educational interventions to reduce farm injury. 
Whenever you talk about farm injury to farmers, this is what they want. We need more education. You survey farmers 20 years ago, so they'll tell you, we need more education. I just was at a farm safety meeting where someone was making a presentation. We just surveyed farmers. They want more education, and they don't know where to find anything. You can type farm farmers know where to find things. You can type farm safety into Google, and you can find farm safety literature that will amaze you. And it's all the same, and it's been all the same for 20 years. So, but it hasn't shown to be effective. And, and the media doesn't help. So this is from any farm, farm people here. Everybody's read The Western Producer, right? That was the paper that came weekly. I remember looking at it when I was a child. I've been, I've been quoted in it a number of times on farm safety issues. My mom is really proud. Doesn't matter what else I did in life, I quoted it in the Western producer. Um, so this is from May 2014, and when we saw this, of course we got a letter to the editor going right away, us and the Canadian Center for Agricultural Health and Safety in Saskatoon, they wrote a letter as well. And uh, the editor showed a fair amount of contrition after, after this, and they kind of apologized and said, my bad, we probably shouldn't be showing pictures like this as little kids in a working farm environment. And then, just last fall, October 2016, here's our three little uh, Hutterite girls riding in the tractor with Dad. So, again, we write the letter, and the center in Saskatoon writes the letter as well. And this time, in the new Trump world, we got back the editorial responses, this is life. Suck it up. We don't care what you think. The world's changing. So enforcement. So occupational health standards have, have long been thought of as, as a bit of a, uh, a panacea to, to, to sort the problem of farm safety out. So public health people have uh, long been concerned about farm safety. Anybody remember Jim Howell? He used to be the uh, chief medical officer for, for Edmonton or for the Capital Health Region. Well, back in 1973, in one of his first postings in Sturgeon County, he did one of the first farm injury studies in Canada. And here's a quote from that study, virtually all farm injuries are either entirely or partially preventable. The tune hasn't changed. I, I would sing the same tune. Labor groups have lobbied for occupational health and safety compensation insurance to apply to farm workers. Here's uh, some press releases from the Alberta Federation of Labor over the last few years. Um, in 2012, concerns over lack of regulation for, for farm, worker, farm worker safety. Redford's broken her promise to farm workers. So apparently during her run up to be the leader of the Conservatives, she had promised farm safety. Uh, in 2014, 10th Annual Farm Workers Day marks track record of government indifference. And they're still sending out a press release like two weeks ago, whinging about the previous government and their lack of action, even though the current government is acting. So they're still mad, and they're not going to take it. So how does occupational health and workers' compensation stack up across Canada? This is a little bit busy, this slide. But if you look at occupational health, it applies to farms uniformly all across the country now. In the last 15 years or so, this has all changed. It used to be, most places used to exclude farmers, but now it's everywhere. Uh, specific farm safety regulations. Uh, British Columbia has quite an extensive array of these. Other one, I say no here, but it's very, very uh, tiny here and there. Like there might be something to say about mushroom growing or something like that. It's not really comprehensive about the whole agricultural industry. And all but three provinces have mandatory compensation for farm workers now. So only Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Saskatchewan um, don't have mandatory compensation. And I bring in compensation here because uh, if you know how the compensa workers' compensation system works, it's kind of like a stick for the employer. So a industry like farming will be have a certain rate applied to it that, based on the uh, payroll, uh, employers will have to pay in pay the insurance. And then above that, if you're a poor performer or a very good performer, your rate will fluctuate within that, that, that industry rate structure. And if your industry as a whole is really, really crappy, like say roofing in Alberta here, 
which is about $20 on the $100 payroll or something horrifying like that. And if you ever seen roofers scampering around a roof, because they never use their protective equipment, you understand why. And it's not a question of, what, of if they're going to fall off a roof, it's just a question of when, right? Um, so that's how industries are judged, and that's how they're... Uh, if you have a poor safety record, you have to pay more. So it does incentivize uh, better behavior. And specific farm safety regulations are under review right now. I just finished, in Alberta, they're under review. I just finished uh, sitting on one of the technical working groups for that. Our report on best practices hasn't been released yet, but they're starting to dribble out of the government right now. The labor standards, the one that came out this week. So I don't have Alberta on here yet because um, we still don't know what's going to be finalized in that regard. But if you look at labor standards, some of the things that we take for granted don't apply to farms in Canada. So minimum wage, minimum wage laws, you think, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to get my 10 bucks an hour or whatever the province says is the minimum wage. Well, that only applies in British Columbia, Quebec, or Newfoundland. Statutory holiday pay. Everybody likes a stat, right? You work in a stat, you get time and a half or whatever it is, you get extra money. My son works at the airport. He never gets his stat off, but he makes a ton of money because he's working those stats, right? Only applies in Quebec and Newfoundland. Vacation pay. Don't we all like to take a vacation? Only applies in British Columbia, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. Overtime pay rules, none. Hours of work, none. So you can see that farms have uh, been treated uh, rather differently than other occupational uh, groups. So why have farm operations enjoyed these exclusions from labor standards and delayed occupational health and safety rules? Well, the first go-to for most people would say that, well, politicians pander to the rural vote. The rural vote is worth more than an urban vote. And I, th I think this is quite a simplistic view. Um, in Alberta now, certainly uh, the urban centers um, uh, have, have trumped the rural vote. Maybe 40 years ago they didn't, but certainly uh, rural votes certainly don't have the, the swing power and the, the power to change elections like they used to. What I think is more likely is a couple of things. I think farmers are actually a very organized group. Um, they presented, regardless of what the commodity is, be it eggs or be, be it dairy cows, they presented a nonpartisan image. So when we think of farmers as a bunch of urbanites, we think, oh, farmers, farm this, farm that. But we don't draw distinctions between the different commodity groups like we would between the lumber industry and the oil industry and things like that. Farmers have been very successful in, keep in presenting a unified front to government. Farmers are better informed of legislative change that may affect profitability. Uh, one of my uncles who used to farm up by Collington told me once, he said, you're a fool as a farmer if you only farm land, you farm the government as well. There's two things you farm. So the government through legislation or what subsidies are available, all these things, right? You have to kept, be kept abreast of these. And finally, there is a history of farms being treated differently in North America. Not just North America, this, this agrarianism is in, has developed in China at a point, it's developed in Europe. It is um, commonly attributed to Thomas Jefferson in the States, who referred to the yeoman farmer as a special person who sacrificed profitability for the good of the nation to produce our food. So what if agri ag agrarianism, uh, it's a tough word, um, agriculture is fundamentally superior to other occupations. Farming is a way of life, not a business. And farmers have a special relationship with the country because like the country, they're bound to the land. Other occupations can pick up and leave and cross borders. A farm cannot do that. You are bound to the land. So I, I said I'd come back to this later on. So I want to look at here who died. So again, 47% owner-operators, 13% child, and another 5% of other relatives. So that's about 65% of all the fatalities 
over the last 20 years, so a majority of the fatalities. And if we look back at this chart on occupational health and, health and workers' compensation, what we see here, while OH&S applies to farms, it only applies to farms with paid employees, and either this is explicitly set out in the OH&S Act in different provinces, or it's explicitly set out through the sole proprietor business, so, or um, type of business. So, Don Volklander, epidemiologist, I hang my shingle out. I don't have to worry about OH&S or compensation or anything like that. Don Volklander, Don Volklander, Epidemiology, Inc., and I hire some employees, and all of a sudden, I'm not a sole proprietor of business any longer, and I have to follow the rules. And the same goes for compensation. It only applies to farms where there's paid employees. So to summarize this a little bit about the legislation, le legislative interventions have the least impact on the population at greatest risk, the farm family. So in summary, we've seen a modest decline in farm-related fatality over the last 20 years. Gains that have been made have been largely due to engineering improvements. Education measures used on their own to reduce injury are not sufficient. And the, farm, the family farm falls outside of legislative safety measures that protect paid farm workers. So what's next? Where could we get improvements in safety? I don't think anytime soon governments are going to say, your sole proprietor farm is different than all the other sole proprietor businesses out there. So we're going to legislate farm safety just on farms. I don't think that's going to happen. And this is not a crowd that wants that to happen. Like, uh, like the agrarian says, it's a lifestyle, not a job. And there's very much organized resistance to, uh, to changing that way of life. But, <clears throat> but what's coming down, and it might not be in any of our control, so something called supply chain management. So recently, the European, the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work uh, released a white paper promoting occupational health and safety to the supply chain. And this has already happened in Europe with regard to um, the care of animals on farms. So the consumer wants ethical food. And so they're worried about the care, the care of animals. And it's starting to wash over into humans finally. Go figure, right? Eh? And in North America, we're already seeing, uh, this is from McCain Foods, their supplier code of conduct. Suppliers are provide a safe, clean, and healthy work environment and, and abide by all applicable laws with respect to health, safety, and the environment. This includes implementing appropriate safety procedures, training, preventive maintenance, and protective equipment. And wait for it, Walmart, the paragon of employee relations, suppliers must provide workers with a safe and healthy work environment Suppliers must take proactive measures, proactive measures to prevent workplace hazards. So this is quite interesting. And if you're, if you're uh, aware of what's happening in the States with supply chain management of the poultry industry, you know that this is a very powerful tool because the way poultry is produced in the States has changed dramatically because everybody wants that perfect KFC-sized chicken, and if you can't produce it by the supply chain management rules, you're out of business. And that concludes my talk. I'd like to thank Colleen Drool, my data analyst, for preparing all my data slides. She does such a great job. And the Canadian Agriculture Injury Reporting System collaborators for collecting all the data across the country for this. And it wouldn't be a good talk unless I showed you a red Porsche. This is a 1953 Porsche diesel. So um, notice how the cowling streamlined on it, just to make sure when you're plowing the field, you get the maximum benefit. Thank you.
you can type in your um, um, question and then Rachel will pass it off. So this question comes from online uh, from Richard. Why do you think education doesn't work to reduce accidents? Uh, well, it's an interesting um, conundrum with farmers. They understand that they need more information, but uh, a recent farm credit corp or, uh, federal farm credit corporation survey was asking farmers what they needed, and they said more education. But then 70% of them also said that the biggest barrier is old habits, and old habits always trump education in an occupational health setting. In my experience, and I've worked in sawmills for many, many years, and the old habits guys are the hardest ones to get to correct. So unless you're willing to take a step back and say, I've done this 10 times, but it's probably not the safest way to do it, and maybe I should change my behavior. If you're not willing to do that, education is going to be a failure. Thanks, Dr. Volklander. Um, so I saw in your main causes slide, there are a number of things up there, but one thing I didn't see was suicide. And I think that suicide usually gets classified as an injury generally. I'm just wondering if you can speak at all to suicide rates on farms. Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not up on the current suicide rates on farms. We don't consider it an occupational injury. Um, I know it, it can be an issue, especially if there's some tough tough economic turns that certain commodity groups take, but I couldn't tell you the numbers. You've indicated that uh, education is desirable, but uh, not necessarily very effective yet. I wonder if it's possible to target your education towards, uh, I would suggest, women and younger farmers. Those are good points. And also, uh, perhaps in agricultural colleges and places like that, where people are, uh, prior to entering the, um, the profession, can get some training before they develop the bad habits. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying education is all bad, but it usually has to be work in conjunction with some sort of structure. So if it works in conjunction with if a farmer develops a safety plan that he adheres to, then the education augments that. But education on its own, giving somebody a brochure or, uh, or, or talking to them, maybe is not the most effective way to reduce farm injuries. Another question from online from Lyndon. Can safety be improved or enhanced by implementing an inspection and fine system for actions such as removing PTO shaft guards? Well, inspections... Uh, uh, an interesting thing. Um, there are a lot of farms, and I don't think that any province in this country has enough inspectors to inspect all the farms. Uh, certainly, uh, I believe in most provinces, if somebody reports an unsafe uh, situation on a farm, there is an obligation for an inspector to check that out. But I don't think we're going to see any anytime soon spot checks on farms. Um, I know they've been doing some of that in Quebec. Uh, I remember seeing a presentation a few years ago where they've been trying to ramp that up, and they seem to have a bit of an effect in terms of improving safety. I just don't see it as something that's going to be comprehensive. I'm wondering about uh, treatment of temporary foreign workers versus not temporary foreign workers on farms that have paid employees. Uh, uh, as far as their injury experience goes? or Well, the occupational health laws would apply to them because they would be employees on, on the farm like any employee would, would be. I know there's um, a fair amount of work done being in various parts of the country right now, uh, trying to produce edu educational materials, again, for uh, temporary foreign workers in a variety of languages. And also, uh, 
training employers on how to train temporary foreign workers where, where they come from, maybe the safety behaviors are a little bit sketchy. And so when they come here uh, to work in Canada, um, they need to be sort of brought up to speed on some of the way we maintain safety here. Clearly, you've done a lot of research in this area, and I'm just wondering if you think the government of Alberta invests enough resources to in farm safety and injury prevention. Well, that's that's a, a good question. As you can see from, um, or at least I hope you can see from my presentation, these are complex public health issues. Um, I think the government of Alberta would be uh, would do well to invest more money in safety in general and injury prevention in general. It's a big ticket cost item for the health system. Um, so, for example, all these farm injuries that are suffered by farm families that aren't covered by compensation insurance, we all pay for that, right? So um, if we can reduce injuries for farms and overall, it will save the government a lot of money and we can have a few more hip replacements and whatnot. So another question from online from Sharon. Can an inquest be held to review an accidental death for a farm worker? I, an inquest can be held for any any type of death if um, if uh, society merits it or it seems to be a, a, a sufficient um, uh, uh, uniqueness that would would trigger that inquest from a coroner. Um, Kathy, when you were doing the child death reviews, did you do farm farm kid deaths ever? Okay. I mean, what I what I find with with farm deaths in general is that it, it they're very there's very very little there's very little oversight. So the police don't have any oversight, and it's a farm family. Oh and S doesn't have any oversight. So you know, in other negligent parental situations, especially around pertaining to children, there might be some interest in in performing an inquest or determining some better way of doing things, but in my experience, that doesn't happen on farms. It, the, the society is kind of hands off, and that's where I go back to that agrarian um, philosophy: is that we've all sort of treated farms different. Um, Don, have you ever looked at um, uh, the the difference in injury rates between farmers who, where farming is their is their primary uh, is their primary job like they do it sort of sort of all day every day versus the people who have the job in town and then do their farming uh, part time or on the side in addition to other work? We did look at um, farm injuries in Alberta. Here we we assembled uh, we linked um, the farm fuel tax subsidy list from back in the 90s to Alberta Health data a number of years ago, and we followed farm families over time. And what we found is that the injury experience of people, urbanites, who are also farmers, doesn't vary that much from the people that live on the farms uh, full time. Their, their experience is a little bit lower, but not as substantial as you would think. Yeah, your data you presented is fatalities. How much work have you done on non-fatality injuries uh, on the farming environment? Well, the primary difference between fatal injuries and non-fatal injuries is the number of animal-related injuries. So that, uh, if you look at hospitalizations, you would see a lot more animal-related injuries. Less severe, mind you, but still quite a numerous, numerous amount. Um, the other injuries that you get that are uh, hospitalizations, you get a lot of, a lot of fractures, a lot of uh, tool-related um you know, machine shop types of injuries, things like that. Farmers are great fabricators. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you've started looking at uh, the impact of, or if you started looking at doing community-based research and working with the farmers uh, on what they perceive as the biggest issues and challenges and ways to overcome it um, from their perspective. Uh, yeah, I'm an epidemiologist, so I don't really like working with people. But um, 
I, I, I do have some colleagues. I, uh, there's a guy that's brand new to the occupational health and safety. His name escapes me right now, but he's an anthropologist and he works out of the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin. Um, the Marshfield has a big Marshfield Clinic has a big agricultural s section. So uh, that so there's something called the North American Guidelines for uh, Agricultural Tasks for Children. That was their baby. Uh, they're probably the in the states for the the biggest research center. So he's starting to do a lot more of that type of work to try and, and he's from a farm family himself and trying to understand the best best approach. So that's still a little bit of a novel area. You had mentioned uh, that there was a 1.5% reduction per annum in fatalities. Do you know if injuries and non-fatalities have had the same sort of reduction and if they uh, were largely due to the reduction in the like working populace or due to the engineering and uh, enforcement, as you had mentioned? The slope is a little bit uh, steeper. The reduction is a little bit steeper in, in um, less severe injuries. I only know about Alberta, though, because the rest of the country hasn't looked at their um, hospitalization data, so I can only speak for Alberta. So this is more of a request for comment. Um, Douglas from online says that he believes the point was missed that the farm community believes that they're not subject to urban rules. Uh, the familiar retort is that we look after our own or that it's God's way. And he's wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, again, it just goes back to the way farmers have viewed themselves and the way society, going back to some of the United Farmers of Alberta. The movement that started the agrarian movement, I was talking about Thomas Jefferson, but United Farmers of Alberta started in the 20s. Ironically, they became the NDP who brought farm safety back to the farm. But that was, that was the movement in the 20s to set farmers different than their urban counterparts. So I think... Again, it's, it, it's a lifestyle and it's a world view and we, urban people may have the, that view of the farm and the farmers have that view of themselves. Um, I'd like to come back to the uh, statement you were making about the education and the uh, ineffectiveness of farm safety education. So is it your contention that training is not effective or that the data isn't there to support how effective that training might have been, but it's not measured. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, it, it's hard to measure the outcome from, from training, but training is only effective if you change the culture, and that's part of the problem with education. So you, you can educate people and you can train them, but you, it's hard to change, that, change the culture. So, for example, I was at a farm uh, safety meeting a couple of years ago, and I was talking to this guy from BC who was there representing a bunch of corporate farms from BC, some organization of corporatized farms. And he was telling me an anecdote that his, his particular company bought a bunch of farms down by Tabor, and, you know, corporate entity coming in from BC. We're going to farm in Alberta now. And they, the culture of safety in BC was so radically different, they almost sold the farms in Alberta because they couldn't find anybody that they could train not to do stuff that they'd always done, which was not necessarily the way that the safety culture was in British Columbia. So training is one thing, but you've got you've to move that. The boss has to do everything exactly according to the book and take no shortcuts, and then the culture goes downhill. If that doesn't happen, it's not going to happen. Yeah, that, that could be very powerful. I agree. Yeah. And, and the culture they've come from off the farm. Yeah. Yeah. Another question from online. We have an active online group tonight. Uh, it's from Jason. He would like to know, how are farmers in Alberta with paid workers handling the new regulations? Excuse me, what was that again? How are farmers in Alberta with paid workers handling the new regulations? 
Well, I don't think anybody really knows that. We know that there's been, I don't know, six or seven hundred claims made to the workers' compensation system. So people are signing up. The companies that employ workers are participating. So, and people are getting their claims processed. So it seems to be working. We don't have any specific regs yet for farms. That's still a little bit up in the after, as the technical working group reports come in. So I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a little bit too early to, early to tell how employers are doing. I, I know uh, working with, um, on the technical working group I was on, there's a guy from a Hutterite colony. And Hutterites are good business people. So they were in early on this. And they hired consultants, safety consultants, and the safety consultant said, well, if you don't injure your workers, you're going to make more money. So the Hutterites are all over health and safety now. So things are changing in Alberta, hopefully. Um, just as you're talking about uh, farming culture and lifestyle, I'm curious, this presentation I know is mostly about um, uh, occupational related injuries related to farming, but I'm just curious as you spoke of the animal related injuries, are you still talking in, in terms of kind of like related to the job or I, I'm just thinking of other things like some of the um, riding and rodeo and or, or the more um, accidental recreational things like kids playing. Does, is that factored into these numbers or is that like a, a different topic? So uh, the fatalities, we wouldn't have any equestrian or rodeo activities in there. When we try and sort out the hospitalization data, we basically take out anything to do with a horse because there's actually not that much horse occupation anymore. And usually those are rodeo or equestrian activities. We can, we can parse them out, but there's all... Uh, I remember my first class in my undergraduate degree in phys ed was from David Reed, an old orthopedic surgeon here. And, sports medicine guy, and he said the most, act first class, first day, first sentence, the most dangerous thing you can do in Alberta is ride a horse. So, horses are bad. Well, not, they're not bad, but you, you have to take care. I have one here. Along that same line, uh, I use the, the, the stats that you showed, the data that you showed in presentations to farmers, and the response is often, they don't like to see the stats, for one thing. And um, they say, how can you prove that those uh, accidents and incidents are attributed to the farm? Like maybe they happened, maybe an equal accident would have happened, say if it was a quad accident, and it was somebody quadding out west, but it just happened to be on a farm. Do you have any... Yeah, well, there's not a whole lot of quad deaths on farms. We don't get a whole lot of them. But, um, you know, the, 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 the way we get the fatality data is from looking at the chief medical examiner, the chief coroner's records. And they, they are, there's quite an extensive um, written summary of what happened. So we, we know if it was related to farm work or not. I mean, that's, that's not really an issue, especially with the fatality data. It's a little more, more dodgy with the hospitalization data because you're looking at a hospital chart. And what they write down is, depends on how busy they are and what questions they ask. But a coroner's record is pretty comprehensive. So we know it's work-related. Yeah, I know nobody, nobody likes to look at um, injury data, right? Because it reminds them at that time they dropped their baby on its head. And they don't want to think about that, right? We all have those moments that we wish we could change, the near misses or when something bad happened. So when you talk to people about reducing injury sometime, it, it causes discomfort. Because all those farmers have had near misses, or they've all had friends that have lost fingers or arms. Over here. Hi, Don. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm curious whether there's been thought about, um, in addition to legislation, looking at supports for farmers to implement safety legislation, like some of the safety measures, you know? So, for example, subsidy to get upgraded tractors or equipment that's more safety oriented, similar to what we would say subsidies for upgrading your house to make it more environmentally friendly. Like, Has that route been looked at? So uh, um, in my technical working group on best practices, that's one of the recommendations we have is that there's a subsidy program to retrofit old tractors with rollover protective structures. Uh, that worked to uh, 
uh, reduce the number of rollover fatalities in the state of Victoria, in Australia. The uptake was huge, a few hundred bucks subsidy. They all got ROPs and they stopped dying. So that, that can have tremendous effect. Um, I know from uh, working with my occupational health and safety colleagues over at Labor, they all want to work with employers and they want to work with farmers. If a farmer has a request, they will try and comply because nobody wants to fine anybody, no one wants to see anybody die or be injured. Labor wants to work with employers to make it a safe workplace. And they will bend over backwards to help you if you ask for it. So I believe this is going to be the final question of the night. Um, it comes from online from Lurie. So in your opinion, what is the solution to reducing fatalities on the farm? Wow, a $64,000 question. <laughs> Um, that, that is a really it, it is a very difficult population to work with. I think we've talked about some of the possibilities, the oil field workers retrofitting themselves back onto the farm. Um, I'd certainly like to see fewer children doing farm work that their developmental age uh, sh they shouldn't be doing. Uh, I, mean, I, I know it's part of the culture to you know uh, exposure children to the farm to, to um, get some experience and, and whatnot, but I'd really like to see some of those kids out of the farmyard. And uh, other than that, um, it's a $64,000 question. Well, on that note, um, well, it's been, you can see that the discussion is that generated has been very, very lively. And I want to thank you for that and for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I 